Do you know that 9 out of 10 eye injuries which resulted in severe vision impairment or blindness are preventable? Do you know that basketball, squash, badminton, rugby, and football are the leading causes of sports-related eye injuries? Have you heard that men are more likely to suffer an eye injury than women? By the end of this podcast, you'll know who is more at risk of having an eye injury, the most common types of eye injury, and how an eye injury registry can help in designing prevention strategies. First, I will give a brief introduction about eye injuries, and then I will chat with Annette Hoskin, a research fellow at the University of Sydney Safeside Institute and at the University of Western Australia, Lions Eye Institute, who will tell us about the importance of having an eye injury registry for design and prevention strategies. I am Maria Cabrera Aguas, a researcher at the University of Sydney Safeside Institute. Welcome to the Sydney Eye Podcast. Please consider subscribing to our podcast to receive a notification when a new episode is released. There are two main types of an eye injury, open or closed. An open injury is when the eye wall has a full thickness wound, for example, a penetrated injury with a sharp object or a foreign body. A closed injury is when the eye wall does not have a full thickness wound. For example, when someone or something hits you near the eyeball or the bones of the orbit. A study from 1995 showed that although open eye injuries accounted for only 2% of all eye injuries, they were responsible for nearly half of calls on eye injuries, which were estimated at about $155 million a year Australia-wide. In 2017, a study from our research group reviewed the characteristics of patients who suffer an open eye injury over six years. The study reported 250 cases. 80% of the patients were male. Two out of three patients had an injury due to exposure to an inanimate mechanical force. For example, via use of a hand tool or striking against or struck by sports equipment. Alcohol was implicated in 20 cases with 11 due to assault and falls occurred mostly in older patients. Penetrating injuries and foreign bodies occurred while working with metal and patients who suffer from a foreign object or a penetrating injury had a reduced vision after treatment. Now let's welcome Annette Hoskin, a research fellow at the University of Sydney Safe Sight Institute and at the University of Western Australia, Lions Eye Institute. Currently, Annette is undertaking her PhD under the supervision of Professor Stephanie Watson, who is the head of the Cornell Research Group at the Safe Sight Institute. We are going to chat about her project on establishing a registry to understand better the epidemiology of eye injuries. Thank you, Annette, for joining us in our show today. Welcome. Thanks, Maria. I really appreciate this, this opportunity. So, Annette, to start with, tell us about your project. So, eye injuries and how to prevent them is something that I've been really interested in for a very long time. And so the project that we're currently working on is to try and understand when and where eye injuries happen and to try and better understand how we can manage those eye injuries. But ultimately, by understanding when and where eye injuries happen, we can look toward preventing them and have some great strategies around what we can do to stop them from happening. When did you start uh, um, this study? How many years ago? So the study started... Well, in fact, one of my collaborators, Rapesh Agrawal from Singapore, has been working on this project for a few more years um, than me. And, he, you know, it was something that he started. 
And when I met Rapesh in Singapore in 2018, he told me about the work that he was doing and I asked if I could be involved. And so really the, the project has started to move forward from that time and it's gone through different phases where we've started to collect initial data and we've had different platforms and now we're at an even more exciting phase where we're looking at collecting data from many more centres internationally. I was reading your paper which describes the development of an eye trauma registry. How was the experience of building a registry? Were you the first to build it or others built it first and then you joined? How was the process? So the registry that we first set up was developed by Rapesh and a number of our collaborators. And it was definitely something standalone that we developed specifically to look at eye injuries. And we spent a lot of time initially with our other collaborators from all over the world trying to understand which were the parameters or the, the things that we really wanted to collect and identify And all of that discussion, as you'd imagine, takes quite a long time and quite a lot of negotiation and really um, trying, to, trying to develop and understand the, the best data to collect so that we can have the best possible outcomes and the best opportunity to have an injury prevention strategy at the end of the day. Okay. And um, how many people? countries are involved in this project? At the moment, we have more than 10. We have through the Asia Pacific Ophthalmic Trauma Society, as well as a number of other trauma societies internationally. We have collaborators from all of those groups. So we have representation from South America, the Asia Pacific, US, and Europe as well. And You know, obviously I include Australia in the Asia Pacific region. So we have a lot of a lot of collaborators that we're working with and a core a core team from each of those continents, I guess, that's that's helping to guide the process as we move through. In what year do you start collecting the data? So the first data that we collected was probably in about 2019. And in fact, When we first collected that data, we were really trying to understand what form the registry would best take and we've really revised our opinion about what it, what it will be and we've now opted for an online form which is, which is more secure in the way that we've set it up and we're just about to start collecting more data. So, so we did stop for a period after the initial data collection And, um, and now about to restart the data collection. So, so this year, in the next couple of months, we hope to restart again. Oh, well, I suppose this is for ophthalmologists or eye health professionals. So when they have, I suppose, a patient with an eye trauma, the idea is that they, after the initial consultation or maybe, I don't know, sometime after, they sit down with the medical record and then they enter the data on a website. Is this how it works? So it can actually, depending on the way the different institutions or hospitals work, they can enter the data offline or online. And so we've set it up that way so that it makes it much easier for um, the different institutions to navigate the, the ethics approvals, et cetera, that they need. And if they're entering it online, it means that they go onto a secure website and they have their own password that they enter for their specific hospital. And they could either enter the data live and prospectively, actually when they have the patient arriving, or they could go in after and enter it retrospectively to include all of the information. So it really depends on what's the easiest way for the ophthalmologist or the healthcare professional to enter the data. And obviously they're, you know, we're talking about people that are pretty time poor. So we've tried to make the system as easy as possible for them to enter the data at the time that, that most suits them. Okay. And um, for example, how long does it take them to enter one case into the system? So 
we've we've changed a lot actually since we started with the registry first back in 2019. So the latest iteration or the latest version of the registry that we've we're about to deploy, it should only take the practitioners about 10 minutes to mm. enter all of the data. And what we're trying to do is focus on the key critical information that we need so that when we go through and review, we have the maximum number of data points. And then if there's other information that we would like to collect, for example, about different treatment strategies, then we will be able to dive deeper with that data at a later point. But we've really tried to focus in on all of the key information that we need relating to the circumstances of the injury and exactly what was the, the object involved and whether they were wearing eye protection, what their vision was when they first presented and what the visual outcome is that they, that they had. So all of that information is really critical for us to understand in terms of how we best intervene in the future. Well, how often you're planning to release the reports? So I think the based on the registry in its current form that we're about to deploy, we would like to at least collect one year of data so that we can then review the efficacy of the, the form and make sure that people are um, filling it in correctly and all those things. But obviously, after, you know, we do an initial trial period. So we have already submitted two papers for publication on the initial data that we collected. And I'm imagining that with this refined and revised data collection system or registry, um, that we'd like to collect another year of data that will then allow us to, to revalidate and move forward and start to collect more and more data. And ultimately, my vision would be that we would have some kind of widget or piece of information where we could show in a relatively time efficient way exactly when eye injuries are happening and who they're happening to so we can respond a lot more quickly to any changes in the profile of eye injuries. And if we have a, a really good set of data globally, then it enables us to be able to, to report in a more um, in a more um, in a more definite time frame, in, in shorter time frames to be able to use the data more effectively. The paper that described the registry reported the data globally, not per country, right? So, so we did both in the day oh. in the data that we've already published. We've got it includes the global data as well as the um, individual country data, and I guess depending on how many collaborators we end up having, having, then you know we may do the same type of thing. So it's really important to understand that in different countries, the profile of eye injuries can be quite different. So in Australia, we're seeing more injuries at home and when people are playing sports, whereas in countries like India and China, um, they're, they're seeing more eye injuries relating to um, work-related incidents. And that's, you know, those profiles are interesting and helpful to have. And again, it helps us, you know, define the best prevention strategy. You just mentioned so, some common eye injuries found in Australia. So from this report in Australia, what would be the typical or the most common patient presented with an eye injury? So, so almost universally in all types of uh, injuries, not just eye injuries, males are always more represented than females. <laughs> and the only time that that seems to vary, and, you know, significantly is when ch with very young children, so usually children that are, that are not walking yet and they are more predisposed to falling or with very old females so and it's partly to do with the the gender distribution as people get older um, so other than those two ends of the spectrum mostly we see it's males that are injured and even though 
we have helped to reduce eye injuries at work by using appropriate eye protection. We still see a lot of eye injuries at work and what we increasingly see, as I said before, are injuries relating to things that people do at home. And I think maybe there is some evidence to show that COVID, there's been a bit of a change even from the, the different confinements that people have had. But certainly the work that people do at home, they tend not to protect themselves in the same way that they would do at work. So somebody who's at home who's uh, constructing something and they might be using a drill or a hammer and they're working with metal, then they end up having eye injuries purely because they're not really thinking about the injuries that might happen or the hazards that are there and they're not wearing eye protection. So definitely we could do a lot more to help send that message to try and make sure that people protect themselves at home in the same way that they protect themselves at work. Well, so you were saying that young boys are more prone to have injuries. So, for example, what kind of injuries do they have in your registry? So if we talk about primary school age children, a lot of the injuries relate to play that young boys might do, but they also, and in a similar way, they relate to sport and the sorts of eye injuries that they can often have are fractures to the bones around their eye or something called a blunt trauma where they have no penetration of the eye globe itself but some kind of impact on the eye and that could result in bleeding in the eye which is called a hyphema or a retinal detachment where that that special layer at the back of your eye um, moves away and they can lose vision in that part of the eye so sports and being poked in the eye pens and pencils things that kids use around the home they're definitely all factors that we saw in the registry that are associated with with eye injuries yeah, so for example what kind of what kind of sports so the sports that children and you know all people in fact are most most at risk are the ones where there is a bat or a ball or is there or if there's some risk of collision with another player and so if you think of the classic examples like <laughs> softball basketball volleyball obviously in Australia all codes of football are fairly highly represented but equally things like golf you know if, if somebody Uh, is is hit by a golf ball at speed and that's and you know often clubs and other things if people are obviously not paying attention to who's around them um, badminton is another one and particularly when people are playing doubles and potentially somebody standing at the net is hit by the shuttlecock coming at speed over the net and they're close close to it hitting them and they would often end up with some kind of Um, blunt eye injury as a result and so even sometimes the things that appear quite innocuous that you wouldn't expect to have an eye injury like badminton because you know the shuttle yeah. is pretty small and light um, you can still have an eye injury the other one that commonly happens is squash and I guess huh, we saw yeah. that <laughs> much more in the 90s and yeah. um in earlier periods when squash was more popular and we probably don't see the same number of eye injuries from squash anymore just because it's not as popular. There are definitely standards and eye protection available for for, um, for games like squash and uh, these, these should always be used as well. The thing about squash is that the, the ball itself is just small enough to fit inside the bony orbit around your eye so it not only hits the the globe or the eyeball itself but it also pushes through the bones and squashes the eyeball so you can end up with quite nasty eye injuries and potentially lose vision in, in that eye altogether. Okay and for all ladies what kind of injuries do they experience? What we're actually seeing with the elderly population increasingly is eye injuries from falls. 
And often these are more the more devastating type of eye injury. The thing that's more likely to lead to vision loss is an open globe injury. And that means that the eye itself, the eyeball, is is penetrated or you know that that there is there's essentially a hole in the surface of the eye and that could result in quite severe vision loss so what we've seen in some of the studies we've done in Australia but this has been seen internationally is that people who have had a previous injury or a previous surgery so cataract surgery is common in the elderly population they are falling and falling onto sharp objects. So it might be the bedside table, it might be the coffee table. And add to that the fact that they might be wearing glasses that are not necessarily impact resistant. Mm. Then they can the glasses can shatter or the, the object that they fall onto is, is sharp or results in some kind of penetration to the eye. So this is what we're seeing increasingly. And I think as the population ages and we have more people represented in that part of the spectrum, this is going to be seen more and more. And it's something that we need to definitely keep an eye on in the future and try to have better intervention strategies. Well, I also read on your paper that data from follow-up visits are also collected. What were the visual outcomes in these patients? So, so definitely we try to follow up for at least until they've finished their treatment, which may be into the months and years, or it may be relatively short, depending on how bad the eye injury is. But what we did as, as an over, overall picture, what we saw of all of the open globe injuries that we looked at in our first study was that, and again, the open globe injuries are the more devastating or the more the, the more likely to end up with vision loss. Probably about 20% of those ended up with vision less than 660. So that means that the vision was quite poor in that eye and definitely um, the, the impact of that vision loss would, would be significant from the, the patient's perspective. And if you think about normal everyday vision and the sorts of things that we do every day, to give you an idea, somebody who has vision less than 612 is not able to drive a car. And obviously 660 is much worse than that. So they would have very little functional vision left, and that was one in five of the injuries that we saw were, were falling into that category. Well, based on this data, can you give us like three prevention strategies to finalise our conversation? Sure, and it's probably there's so many that come to mind and to try and think about the best possible prevention strategies is tricky, but... Um, like trying to pick the top three. I think whenever you think about prevention, it's really important to think about the, the hierarchy, what we call the hierarchy of controls. So obviously the best thing we could possibly do is eliminate the hazards altogether. And that means, you know, if you're thinking about a work site where they use a particular chemical that's caustic or toxic to the eye, that we would not use that chemical and would replace it with a safe one. So this is sort of the gold standard in terms of injury prevention is to try and get rid of the hazard altogether. But where that's not possible and in many circumstances we can't anticipate the hazards or the injuries happening, then eye protection is, is a great way of preventing eye injuries. And obviously for those that are doing DIY at home and you know, the sorts of projects that people might be doing that essentially are equivalent to many of the occupations that we see eye injuries in, like hammering or, or drilling, that they should wear the right side of sort of eye protection that, that protects their eye and make sure that there's you minimise the gaps around the side of your eyes. Um, the, other, the other area that we really want to work on is to try and introduce more eye protection for the sports that we see lots of eye injuries in, and I mentioned some of those. 
and to try and have better standards for those different types of sports. So they would be the first two, I would say, and then the third one is probably relating to falls and eye injuries, which we talked a little bit about, and to try and have better education. And there is already a lot of uh, activity relating to falls and helping to try and prevent the, these, and this is not just an Australian issue, this is globally. And so as part of that education, trying to make the patients aware of the consequences if they have a fall, and it may be as simple as not having a bedside table or not having coffee tables so that if they do have a fall, the consequences are not, um, are not as bad. Obviously, we want to prevent the falls and all the other interventions around balance and other strategies to minimise trip hazards and things like that in the home for elderly people are a really good start, but also minimising the consequences if they do have a fall. Wow, Annette, it was very informative. Thank you so much for sharing your project with us today. If people want to contact you, what would be the best way to do it? So I'm more than happy to, to talk to potential collaborators if they want to contact me by email and we can add that in that information in after the podcast. Um, also happy to connect with people on um, on Twitter or on LinkedIn if you have questions in particular about any of the things that we've talked about today. You can contact Annette via email to annettehoskin at yahoo.com.au, via Twitter at annette underscore hoskin or via LinkedIn. I will leave her details on the comment section of the podcast. To recap, Boys and elder women are more at risk of having an eye injury. Boys may suffer an eye injury when playing sports due to a risk of collision with other players. Sports with more risk of eye injuries are basketball, squash, badminton, rugby, and football. Falls are the main mechanism of injury in elder women. Prevention strategies include hazard elimination, use of protection glasses, and education related to falls in the elderly population. I am Maria Cabrera Aguas. Thanks for joining me today in the episode number four of the Sydney Eye Podcast. If you haven't yet subscribed to this podcast, you are invited to consider that to receive a notification when a new episode is released. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please send them to seedipodcast at gmail.com and connect with us on Twitter at Cabrera Marie. It's C A B R E R A M A R I E or at Cornell Research using the hashtag S Y D E Y E P O D. Until next time, bye!